Welcome to our grand finale of today's tour through current and future technologies and marketing. And now in the end, we'd like to use the opportunity to have a little um, look back, a little reflection on the implication. What does that mean for our planet? And how can we use marketing maybe to save it? And this will be discussed by Veronique Franzen, Senior Director Business Consulting at Media Monks, by Nina Haller, she's Managing Director at Media Monks, by Christian Hammerschmidt, Senior Brand Manager at Deutsche Telekom, Matthias Brüll, CEO at Media Plus Group, Samuel Ruff, he's the Global Lead Media at Bayer, and Sir Martin Sorrell, Founder and CEO of S4 Capital. Have fun. Welcome to our Climate Tech Talk, Net Zero Marketing. Thank you for being part of the change. There are two numbers that each of us should know, 52 and zero. The first number quantifies the amount of tons of greenhouse gases we release into our atmosphere each year. The second number equals the target we need to set. Net zero. In order to bring global warming and its disastrous effects to a halt, we must stop adding greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. Greenhouse gas emissions are caused by five major core activities. 29% from industry and manufacturing like plastic, cement, and steel. 26% falls on electricity supply. Another 22% on agriculture. 16% on transport and traffic and 7% on cooling and heating. Our planet is on fire, and in order to achieve net zero, we have to bring every single one of these activities to net zero. The marketing industry is a contributor in all these areas, which means we have a big responsibility to bear and must be part of the solution, especially in reducing the amount of electricity and energy that goes into our work. Clean energy alone may not fully get us to net zero, but it is one of many crucial steps towards that goal. Our planet is dying in front of our eyes, and the future is in our hands. There are many startups and technologies that will help us to achieve the targets and save the planet. Regardless of how and with which technology we do it, we need to reduce our emissions by 2030 to ensure a safe future for the planet and its citizens. And every industry has a role to play in this task including us as a marketing industry. Delay means death. Verzögerung heißt Tod. Willkommen zum ersten Tech Talk des GWA, dem Verband für Deutschlands führende Agenturen. Mein Name ist Nina Haller und ich leite eine dieser führenden Agenturen, die Media Monks. An meiner Seite heute ist Vero, Veronique Franzen. Sie leitet das Tech und Innovation Forum des GWA und ist zudem meine geschätzte Kollegin und Freundin bei Media Monks. Da Deutsch meine Muttersprache ist, und wir heute auch hier in Köln zu Gast sind, möchte ich es mir nicht nehmen lassen, Sie heute auch kurz auf Deutsch zu begrüßen, bevor wir gleich zur Panelsprache Englisch wechseln. Deswegen sage ich, hallo Köln, willkommen zu DMXCO 22 and now let's switch to English. Delay means death. These words of UN Secretary Antonio Guterres should be top of mind for all of us and we should think about it properly. We need to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 to ensure a safe future for our planet and every industry has a crucial part to play. Also we in the marketing industry and that's why we are here today. But before we start to discuss our role, let me tell you something personal. I am really, really nervous. Not because I'm standing on, on, in front of you on this huge stage, no, because this topic is really driving me personal and it touches my heart. And you know, whenever things are becoming personal and emotional, 
you are somehow out of your comfort zone. And that's definitely, for me, the case today. And you have to understand, I'm not a climate scientist or a climate expert. No, I'm a marketing expert like you guys here in the room. Nothing more, nothing less. But every week, every week, I hear concerning news in relation to climate change. Land underwater, burning woods, hurricanes, lack of groundwater. Our planet is dying in front of our eyes. And we have to act fast. We, as a marketing industry, we contribute in all these areas of greenhouse gas emissions. We all have a responsibility within the marketing value chain. The brands, creative agencies, production, media, publishers, tech vendors, procurement, you name it, but also we as consumers. And today we talk about these roles and responsibilities for a future of net zero marketing. And we do it with real marketing heavyweights. I am honored. I'm really proud that you have followed up my offer to be part of this important discussion. Thank you, Sir Martin Sorel. Thank you, Matthias Brühl. Thank you, Christian Hammerschmidt. Thank you, Sam Ruff. And for sure, thank you, Vero, for joining this discussion. Let me introduce you, Sir Martin, founder W2P, founder S4 Capital. You've been with me my whole career. Thank you for that. You have a unique business sense and a clear vision of the market. So thank you for being here for this important topic. Matthias Brühl, managing partner um, and director of Media Plus, board member service plan group, XWPP, XBMW, X Daimler, a lot of X's, but it's important. Christian Hammerschmidt, senior brand manager with over 12 years at Deutsche Telekom. That's impressive. Expert for design, brand strategy, and sustainability. And last but not least, Sam Roof. I hope I pronounce it perfectly. Sam Roof, lead global media director at Bayer, XGSK, XNES, XPNG, and responsible for tier one um, relationships like Mediacom and Google. And with saying that, I'm not get bored. This important is topic, our planet is dying. Handing over to you, Vero. Thank you, Nina. Thank you for bringing us all together today on this stage. Thank you for setting the tone. And uh, yeah, I'm the one with the questions. And uh, I will get us kicked off right away. So Martin, uh, we have discussed and heard in the introduction that responsibility is really a key concept that we want to discuss today. So from your point of view, what do you see from the industry? How is that reality acknowledged? And who should take responsibility for what? Well, I, I, everybody, uh, listening to Nina's words, everybody should take responsibility for it. I mean, uh, there, are, uh, there are two broad camps. I guess when you look at clients, uh, if you look at media owners and you look at agencies, uh, there are two broad camps that you have. And actually, I, I, I think at the end of the day, I'm not sure this may be a controversial thing to say, but in a way, it doesn't matter anymore whether people genuinely are behind what we're talking about or whether they're practicing greenwashing, because we're going to get to the same destination maybe uh, a little bit faster than we would have said a few years ago because of the acceleration of all the problems that we see. I mean, we've got two, um, two forces fighting against one another at the moment. One is, I think, a genuine commitment. You know, we're, we're sitting here in Cologne whilst so-called world leaders are sitting in New York at, at UNGA at UNGA discussing the Ukraine because that's top of the agenda following this morning's uh, broadcast or tape from President Putin. Well, it was on the agenda anyway, but that's sort of top of the agenda in, if you like. But this week, climate change is very much uh, to the fore. So you've got that general pressure as we see all the climatic events around the world. And then you, then you have the, the, the pressure uh, at the same time as a result of the war, as a result of inflation, as a result of higher interest rates, as a result of the recession 
deep or, or shallow, whatever it's going to be over the next two years, that's going to be putting pressure on us to push back on climate change because, the, as we were discussing in the green room about it, uh, it is expensive. You know, uh, we have two clients here who embrace purpose uh, and in, in grace, embrace that genuinely, but where the rubber hits the road, doing what we're talking about, embracing purpose, is more expensive than cutting corners and coming up with the cheapest alternative. You know, what, what procurement might demand is not necessarily what two Ps, what purpose might demand. So there is a lot of conflicting forces. I actually think um, that what we've seen in, since the murder of George Floyd in America, I think that was a seminal event. Obviously, it's, it's very much in the D, E, and I part of ESG. But that was a seminal event because from then onwards, we genuinely started to see rules being put in place, particularly by procurement, actually, which forced the issue. I remember one thing. It was actually a piece of work for Meta, for Facebook, which I'm pleased to say we won. But 40%, I always remember this, it was just after the murder of George Floyd, 40% of the grade was on the diversity of the team. And it meant that if you didn't have a diverse team, and we're 40% people of color in our 9,000 people, if you didn't have a diverse team, you didn't get to first base, let alone hit a home run. So there are sort of conflicting forces. There's you know, people who generally embrace purpose, those who greenwash. I don't think it makes any difference anymore because they're both moving in the same direction. But then you've got conflicting forces of people genuinely wanting to get the job done as quickly as possible. You know, our net zero target was 2024 and we're already at it, um, at that target, but we probably have an easier task than most. And then at the other side of it, the recession that we're going into and all the world's problems, China, US relations, Iran, Russia's position, all of these things are gonna maybe postpone the achievement. So there are a lot of conflicting forces. Thank you. Thank you for this very helpful and insightful contextualization. So that is a great point to start from. And we are here to also talk about when the rubber hits the road, right? So um, I would like to hear from Matthias, because uh, we know that uh, at Service Plan, you have a green GRP offer. So you are trying to actively be part of that change. Would you share with the audience a little bit more about what that is about, how you contextualize it, and how you see your role and your responsibility as a leading agency? Uh, yes, happy to do so. Uh, so um, you were talking about the Green GRP. That was an initiative maybe two years ago we started, when uh, the noise around sustainability was much lower than it is now. But we, as a company, we felt that it is time to uh, to do an initiative, yeah, um, and and to come up with a with a product which we could offer our clients in scale. So basically, what it is, it's a it's a compensation product, yeah. So a part of the media spending, smaller portion, 0.5 percent <clears throat> is invested, it reinvested in projects. We are measuring it together with our partner, climate partner. We are doing that in 10 different uh, countries. And uh, at least as a client, you can see uh, and you have transparency, transparency in, in which kind of projects you are investing in. And uh, you can uh, measure, or we are measuring the impact on that. So, but let me say, that was just the initial uh, product uh, we rolled out. Uh, there are more initiatives coming up. Uh, but we had to start with, with, with one thing. And it was um, for our clients, so it, it wasn't a big problem to, to find clients who were happy to invest in that. Um, so it was a great success. And uh, let me say, we did that together then uh, after we started with other agencies in Germany as well. So it wasn't us alone. Getting started is so incredibly important, right? Was that your from zero to one moment? Was that your moment from zero to one, your first initiative? That was the moment where we thought, 
let's just start very in a very pragmatic way with something. We know it's not ideal, uh, but but let's just build it. Yeah? And um, in the meantime, we have with our clients sustainability circles. We are discussing what can we do. Uh, by the way, Bayer is included as well in that. Um, uh, and, and we are discussing what can we do, and we have some concrete ideas in mind. I think a lot of courage is needed, right, to take these first steps to do trial and error. So just one last follow-up question on that. What does that mean for you personally as an agency leader? What, like, is your role changing with these new requirements? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So um, I think we are tapping into that a little bit more later on, I guess. But, um, you know, it's also about the selection of media. Um, it's also about who of, of the media partners uh, will get involved in that, who will take over responsibility. And, um, I mean, as, a, as an agency, as a media agency, you have an important role because still you are allocating money, right? And, uh, and budgets. And, um, and therefore, the allocation might look different in the future because it's not only the traditional media KPIs we are looking at in the future, it's also KPIs that we are discussing right now. So what kind of impact does each and every campaign have on sustainability, for example? So in that, there we have to take some, uh, there, there we have to be, to be brave, yeah? And, um, and, and, and sometimes it causes an impact. I'm sure, I'm sure it does. Yeah, your, your clients demand that they have their own initiatives as well, and um, we're so lucky to have today two super active, super strong brands on stage as well. So, Sam, in our preliminary conversations, you teasered a little bit. You told me a little bit, a little bit about Media for Good, and I found that super interesting, and I think the audience is going to find it super interesting as well. So, would you share with us a little bit what you're up to and what you're trying to achieve? Yes, thank you, first of all. Thanks for inviting me. It's great to be back here at the Mexico. Um, I was here three years ago. I saw Sir Martin on stage, and uh, I thought it would be a great idea to be here as well on this stage, a bit closer, uh, with front row seats. So um, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the vision we had last year uh, when we ran our global media pitch, uh, which is something we called media for growth and media for good. So media as a force for good. Um, and we're gonna focus on that today, on the good part, doing good. Um, and the way we articulated it is um, through three different pillars. The first one is about sustainability, and that's what we are here for mainly. Um, and this is about carbon footprint reduction. Uh, originally, we looked at carbon footprint offsets, but then we realized quickly that uh, it's much more powerful to reduce it to begin with. Um, and we'll talk about the, the, the tension on costs as well. Um, but there are some low-cost actions or low-hanging fruits that we can all take collectively as an industry to reduce the carbon footprint impact. Um, and I'm happy to talk about these. Uh, the second pillar is diversity and inclusion. And this is something that our US team is uh, spearheading and making really great progress um, with the likes of um, so media ownership, diversity, um, diverse audiences targeting, and also representation in the ads themselves. So diverse representation and inclusion. And the third pillar is about responsible media so this is um, in partnership with GARM, the Global Alliance for Responsible Media, which is a WFA initiative, and taking it to the, to the next level, basically. Um, so from brand safety to brand suitability, and there's a great brand suitability framework uh, that is available out there, um, into brand purpose, which is like kind of the next level. Uh, and we looked at things like supporting quality journalism as well as an objective through our media dollars. Uh, so that's in the nutshell the Media for Good vision in three pillars of sustainability, DNI, and responsible media. Can can we 
can we interfere? Please right. do. We can have a conversation, ignore you. Um, ju just, just to pick up on that, Sam, um, as we move into recession or slower growth, and maybe the healthcare category and the telecoms bring Christian into this as well, the, the healthcare and telecoms categories are different, maybe because their underlying growth may be better, certainly in, in, in pharma. But do you think there will be more tensions? I mean, let, let's abstract from Bayer and Deutsche Telekom for a minute and just think about clients in general. Everybody says, you know, the great and the good in the marketing world say, you have to keep on spending, you have to keep on investing, you have to purpose at the center and sustainability. But CEOs and CFOs and procurement, are they gonna drive this down as we go into 23 and 24 or not? Yeah, so it's a great question. And there is a tension on cost uh, by doing media for good um, that we're trying to manage. Uh, there are also a few low hanging fruit actions that we can all take collectively as an industry. And I think Tina from Nestle was talking about this uh, this morning. She, she talked about it also at the WFA forum uh, in Cannes. Um, and it's about uh, reducing um, carbon consumption, so electricity consumption from the media supply chain with actions like only delivering impressions uh, to Wi-Fi so instead of 4G, 5G, which is much more electricity um, consuming, uh, focusing on Wi-Fi deliveries and day parting as well when electricity costs are lower. Um, so that's one. Uh, there's also a couple of actions on the creative side, so the, the size, the file size of the assets. Uh, videos or, or pictures, you don't need to have them in 4K, you know, high resolution when it's going to be viewed on a mobile for 80% of the time. So reducing file size, and that's some great work that uh, L'Oreal has been doing on, um, on this front uh, with Matthias. Uh, so we are kind of, as an industry and, and as a group in the WFA forum, um, discussing this and finding ways to collectively address it uh, because there is a pressure on cost. So we're first starting with what can we do that has a very limited cost or no cost at all that will reduce carbon footprint. Yeah, so I think uh, we, we have at Telecom like two aspects on that. So we are a big media spender and of course we have to be more efficient there as I said, you know, know the target groups better, invest smarter, reuse it. On the other hand, we are just delivering the network with our antennas and all that stuff. So our, we are the consumer. I mean, our antennas just use a lot of electricity. So we have to be smarter as well, use smarter technology, invest in autonomous antennas. They save the solar power, for example, and then work without any electricity consumption. So we are working on both of those aspects as we see it as crucial to be clever and smart on both of those. So, Christian, um, on LinkedIn, you were very vocal about how a brand to the consumer is a promise, right? And when it comes to sustainability, what kind of promise does the brand Deutsche Telekom hold? Yeah, I mean, the, the promise that Deutsche Telekom holds is like, um, we won't stop until everyone is connected. And, and those connections go far beyond uh, the, the pure technical connection. It's also about the emotional uh, connection the connection um, of humans, which at the end means uh, if we take sustainability serious, it's a movement and we have to change like the mind and the way we act. And that is something that we all have to do. So um, this connection that we are providing for me is the base to connect the people and with this stand for the, uh, the good in the sustainability and, and really engage on the sustainability topic. So that is one of the biggest promises we can offer as Deutsche Telekom. And of course, giving the technology for all of us to use it in the best way we can. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I just... <laughs> um, just picking up on what Sam and Christian said, um, and you made, you know, you, 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 you referred to other people as well, other clients. Do, do you think... It strikes me that there are going to be very distinct 
geographical differences in terms of execution. You know, the last 50 years, it didn't matter where we planted a flag, as long as the demographics were good, free trade, globalization drove growth. I think given what's happening at the moment, and likely the, you know, US, China, Iran, Russia, whatever, there's likely to be greater differences. Do, do you think that will be carried through to sustainability and purpose? Do you think, you know, to my mind, it's going to be much more difficult for European companies, European trading companies active to do it, much easier for maybe North American, US, Canadian, South Amer Middle Eastern, maybe some Asian. Um, is there going to be a geographic difference or do you think it's going to be global? Yeah, I think considering our footprint, uh, which is more or less the Eastern Europe part and of course uh, T-Mobile US, we are facing what we are asking every day. Because it, it's a difference if you are like in the Czech Republic or Poland, which is much closer to the right. Ukraine, for example, than, than Germany or the US. So um, it's not done by just having one message pointed there and it, right. out it goes. It, it really has to be more on the point. So that's what I meant with knowing your target group much better because you have to understand the cultural differences out there. You have to see how the politics is going in that specific country and how the conflicts especially with regards to sustainability, um, are there existing. I mean, if you are close to a country that's living in war, they obviously might have different things to tackle than just telling them, okay, reduce your energy consumption because they want to be in touch with their uh, most beloved ones. And they don't care if it's uh, using one uh, megahertz more or less. So it, it's really difficult. Yeah, and if I can build on this, I think there, there will be differences in, in Europe and here in Germany, we see it already. Uh, if you go out at night, you will see that the cathedral uh, is not lit up anymore. They switched off the lights at night. So there's already actions to reduce energy consumption because also of the anticipated rise in cost and the challenges on supply. Uh, so it's already happening and ourselves, you know, as a media industry and we're looking at ways also uh, to, to do something similar. If we were to do an out of home campaign with digital out of home, we might also switch off the screens at night uh, to try and save electricity. So things like that. But yeah, Europe is, is going to be hit um, quite badly do, uh, on that. Just related to that, do you think... Um, that a lot of your thinking is driven by, there are two communities that we find drive our thinking. Um, obviously our clients, what are they doing and how, so in your case consumers, yeah. and then our people. I mean, the, our, our approach is driven by what our people say. You know, who we work for and what we do you know, I, can, I won't say what they were, but I can give you examples where our people basically refuse to work on certain clients in certain categories. So would you say now that consumers have morphed? I mean, if we went back in time, that wasn't the case. You know, a lot of discussion about whether consumers would pay for sustainability. You know, organic food was more expensive, would they pay for it? No. Do you think that's changed now? And, and those two communities, let's talk about those. Your consumers and your people are determining, are driving what you both are doing at Bayer and Deutsche Telekom. Yeah. Um, I think for both communities, as you say, it's pretty much the same uh, thinking. On It's generational uh, that they want to work for a purposeful company. And I was having this chat also last night with uh, our head of corporate comms, uh, Sven. And in fact, I think we're really well placed as a company, you know, Bayer or Bayer, as we say here, um, because of what happened also with COVID and like the realization that health is priority number one. And also the fact that we are science-led company. So it's science for 
a better life, science for better. Um, so that's our purpose. And um, our vision, which is um, health for all and hunger for none. I mean, it's a beautiful tagline, first of all. <laughs> but I think it's attracting also this, these two communities, as you say. And um, I had this discussion also with um, um, Mediacom uh, last week, our agency. And they have, specifically, they have talent that want to move to clients like us because of that, because we're a purposeful company, because of health and uh, the importance that I think it's become even more relevant through COVID. Okay. Yeah, so first of all, I think um, what you mentioned about the organic food and do want the consumers to pay more for it, I doubt it, to be honest. Um, they just expect that we do good and it comes along without doing any explicit decision. And that's, I think, the only way where we can really make our um, best out of it because, um, you know, activating people is so difficult. It, it's really difficult to, to make them do something good if it costs more or if it's difficult, you know, if the UI is working wrong, something like this. So if we bring out products and offerings that are per se good, they can do like five or ten good things a day and we maybe tell them once or twice in the journey that they did so and they'll be happy. But if we ask them to pay more money, I doubt that that will happen. I think it's like, yeah, it's, it's a buzzword, like the hygiene factor. You have to be good and you have to offer it. Probably they will not honor it in the first place. But if you do not, they will like really dismiss you and, and tell you that you're doing wrong. So that's for the customers or the consumers. And for our people, um, being an attractive employee, it's, uh, of course, uh, we need to be good to get uh, good people working with us. Yeah. I think we already agreed in our talks backstage that nobody can do this alone, right? We all work as part of a chain, of a marketing value chain. We all work with partners and suppliers. So in your case specifically, what does that mean for your partnerships and maybe with an eye to procurement? This is something I'm really curious about. Yeah, I think we are used to um, focusing on uh, sustainability requirements in the procurement process since a uh, very long time. Um, first of all, it did not start uh, when it comes to media spendings, but we were hardware producers, so we produce our own routers. We have uh, corporations with China vendors since ages. And there, of course, uh, the procurement was driving like sustainability things, uh, having no poisonous uh, colors on the hardware, um, having fair um, production processes and stuff like that. So we are used to it. Um, and, and now we're transferring those um, requirements towards other uh, procurement and buying processes. I'm not sure if we will do the same um, in the same strict and harsh uh, regulation as we are doing it with vendors in China, for example, because it might slow us down when it comes to agility, working with little companies, and when the regulatory expectations are too high, it gets difficult for small companies to fulfill them. That's what we learned out of other processes. So I would be happy if um, procurement process reflect more on sustainability needs, but we have to be, you know, like, be careful not to overload it from the process perspective. Okay, we, I think that, sorry, go ahead. Um, yes, so uh, to build on what you were just saying, so um, I have to say, when we really take it serious and when you as big global companies take it serious, um, I would wish for more responsibility out of your procurement departments because as long as I as an agency leader find myself in bidding platforms when it comes to global pitches and none of that is reflected, uh, then I have to say, and, and you are using auditors with templates out of the 90s, uh, then it's not, uh, it, it's not really serious. But I, I think this is something we should just tackle together. Yeah? So I don't blame you, I just think we, we need to tackle it. I suffer from the same thing. So of course, the, the templates from the 90s uh, weren't made by me, obviously, and uh, I, I think we have to overcome this very fast, yeah. But it's very difficult to, be, uh, listening to this, what came into my mind is we, we participated last week I won't, won't say which industry, it would be unfair, in, in a reverse bid auction. So 50% so of the grade was qualitative, 
and 50% was on pricing. And there were three agencies left in the final round. It was a blind auction, and it started uh, every minute, if you stayed in, you couldn't tell what your other two competitors were doing. Every minute you stayed in, they reduced the bid by 1%. So it went 100 after one minute, 99, 98. Now, it seems to me that you know, procurement can do some good things by setting rules, like the Facebook example I gave you, or the Meta example about, about people of color and, and, and diversity. But, but it, there's an antithetical issue there that, that procurement can go in the wrong direction. And a lot of what we're talking about is, is priced at a premium or is more expensive. You know, you said, Sam, there are some things you can do, you know, low-hanging fruit accepted. But to take it further, it's going to cost more. It's a bit like the consumer with organic food. I mean, if you are really going to push purpose through, it's going to cost you more. And that's where I think it's going to get quite difficult as we go, go through next year. But, but, but I, I, I just think, you know, I, 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 I recoil against the idea that creative can be measured, you know, can be, can be dealt with in, in that way in a reverse bid auction, a blind reverse bid auction. So there's, there's that fundamental thing. But I just think the mentality has to shift in procurement in part. I think this calls for a replicate, so <laughs> <laughs> let's open the stage. Right, so um, we work very closely with our procurement partners. In fact, they would have been here. Um, Thomas, who is my uh, partner in crime on the pitch and uh, is here in Cologne but couldn't make it, would tell you also, we're looking at it from a qualitative angle and it might cost more. So we're also looking at what is the approach with you know our consultants, our media sense? You know we're looking at. We still have to deliver the uh, pricing commitments, but we want to increase this kind of qualitative measures. So it's work in progress. Um, but I think to your point, Vero, um, the platforms where most of the investments are going and growing. Uh, I think they have a really big responsibility in driving this for the industry. Uh, I know Google are doing a lot already. We're partnering with them closely. I mean, there are others. Um, because I don't think one company alone can really have an impact. And um, that's why we're kind of trying to do this at industry level and with the partners. But yeah, the tension on, on the cost uh, element is, is real, yes, yes. and uh, we need to find a sweet spot. And there's, there's one other sort of tension that strikes me. I mean, you're both listed companies. We're listed, service plan is private. Um, but the, the issue in private equity, it seems to me the listed sector is under much greater pressure to get things done. Now, private equity, is probably about 15 to 20 percent of Western industry, you know, the major markets, US. And as a proportion of deals done, I think last year it was a half. So it's increasing its market share, and private equity is becoming more important. Do you, do you think, just you're, 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 neither of you are, are in private equity, they, do you think that they get away with it? putting you on the spot. <laughs> um, yeah, I a, mean, law, a law for the rich and a law for the poor. I think we need to come to the same realization, all of us. I think that's the theme of today. We need to act fast, fast, fast uh, to make an impact because the planet is burning and it might cost more, but this is the time is now. And I think, yeah, the private equity, I don't know how to reach out to all of them collectively. I don't know if there's like an industry body of some kind, but you know, through the WFA, I think we represent the top advertisers. Right. So we're, we're trying to do something in that direction. Yeah. Christian? Yeah. Yeah, I don't see that, that conflict for us. I mean, we are in a very special position as Deutsche Telekom. I mean, uh, our main shareholder is like the, the, the state. So yeah. um, 
they want their uh, money at the end of the year. But if we believe in it and make good numbers, I think we have a bit more freedom than other companies. Okay. Can I? <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Vera. No, you're doing a fantastic job. So, <laughs> on top of being the moderator, um, or my co-moderator, thank you for that. <laughs> I wanted to ask, based on what we've heard, um, when we look at the global, um, at the global setting, at the global uh, contextualization of this, do we see very clear common trends, or are there different companies that do very bespoke initiatives? And I have on top a question: Do you see any regional differences, or is it really all about the global approach? You have tackled this a little bit, but just to sum yeah. it up. Well, I, 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 at the beginning, I said I don't think it matters in a way now. The irony about all this, whether people, well, I think morally you, you want people to believe in things, but, you know, if they're greenwashing, it sort of doesn't matter anymore because they're going to get, they're going to get to the same point, maybe not as quickly as you would like, though, if they were passionately interested, but at least they're, they're going there. The thing that I'm really worried about is I think the world has changed um, and it changed, it's changed ironically in the last six to nine months. I mean, it's been building, but I think the world is such a difficult place that the things that we're talking about, the danger is that they're gonna get jettisoned. Uh, you know, you have John Kerry saying that the Chinese didn't pull away from climate change discussions, they suspended them. And he said the use of that word suspended was really important. Let's hope that he's right. But you know, people obviously have been very focused on COVID. The Chinese have been very focused on zero COVID. Um, India, which is an alternative growth pattern Uh, in Asia, and I think will be, well, is already becoming more important. On, on Bloomberg this morning, one of the leading investors in the world was talking about return on invested capital, and the, the highest returns on invested capital you can get at the moment are in India, and that will be grow growing. So a lot of clients um, who have exposure to China, China is their number one, number two, or number three market. And there's obviously climate change issues around China, although the Chinese have been very, don't underestimate how strong they've been in terms of trying to create change, but at the same time, coal powered, oil powered, you know, uh, electricity and, and energy is still very significant. So the, the biggest worry that I have is we, we will have pressure internally from our people to change and deal with it. We'll have pressure from consumers, but the economy, and I think the world has changed. It's the, growth is not going to be two to three percent or three to four percent. It's more likely to be one to two, and it's not going to be global. It's going to be patchy, and I think that will result in inconsistent behavior geographically or functionally. And I think that's a real risk. I mean, the war, and after this morning's announcement, it looks as though it's more likely to be prolonged than finished, but one hopes that it, it could be finished, but it looks doubtful. That's going to create huge problems. You know, we're sitting here in Germany, which bears the brunt because of its energy policy, historic, bears the brunt of the, the force on natural gas. So I, I, I'm really worried about that. I think um, and we, we haven't really all sorted out which way it's going to go. So huge, you know, no deal with Iran. I, I was not in favor of the deal, the supposed deal with Iran, but at least Iran would have solved some of the energy shortage, which I'm sure was in the Americans' mind. But there's that to solve, there's China, US, there's Russia, huge issues. And I really worry about our ability, you know, in enlisted companies or private companies to deliver in that environment. But What is the 
change that each and every one of us can drive, not as companies, but as individual people? It's an open question to all of you. Okay, so I'll go first. Um, I came from Geneva by train to New Mexico. <laughs> it was a nine hour train ride <laughs> with a stopover in, in Zurich, which was planned to meet our local teams, and a stop in Mannheim, which wasn't planned <laughs> because of a missed connection. But apparently, not, any. Not a good train station. Well, well, they had a pretty good breakfast there. But um, are you going back by a nine hour train journey? <laughs> but what I heard is like a train trip in Germany is not complete without a train issue or a missed train <laughs> when you go across the country. So I've done the full experience. Uh, so that's one action that people can take. Three years ago, I also came by train. It was a bit smoother. So I mean, yeah, small things. but. I try to multiply the responsibility. I have three kids. The way they grow up, the way they consume media. Um, I, I, I raise them in a way that they are feeling kind of responsible in how they behave, how they are, how they are using media. And, uh, and that comes to your point about social uh, responsibility as well, quality in media, things like that. Uh, so uh, this is what I do personally. Yeah, I think personally, um, or what you just said, I mean, we can all do that uh, by increasing the temperature of the refrigerator, whatever. Um, but in general, I think the biggest impact I can do is uh, from the business point. I mean, where I work and following a motto like uh, sustainability by design, I'm sure I make the biggest impact. And that's what I try to do. I mean, in Germany, I would call it Enkelfähigkeit, which means uh, readiness for grandchildren. So by every action I do, I try to remember, is this specific action like Enkelfähig, will it help the generation of our grandchildren to be living in a safe place as we do, to live in an environment that we have still? So that's, I think, where I make the biggest impact in my professional life. And the, and the good thing about COVID was it encouraged more working from home, more dispersed working, and less travel, and with all the obvious implications, and we managed to get our net zero target faster than we thought we were going to, we were going to do. So I, as long as those changes are permanent, and I know there are some people in investment banking who want everybody back in the office five days a week, I, I wouldn't go with that. I think the more flexibility there is, the better it is, and the more flexibility there is in terms of disbursement. So some good news. You have all been fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank we're. You. We're at the top of the hour, Nina. What yeah. do we take home? Yeah, Blois, please, let me sum it up. So, guys, I think there's no time left. This is not an Excel exercise, right? So we really have to do something, and this is really, for me, an important topic. And therefore, I would really love to first thank you all to be on stage today, but this is just the beginning, right? We really have to do something, and I'm worried as hell, really. This is really worrying me. There's one new player in our, at our table, and it's the Earth. The Earth as our future shareholder. Rethink the way you do marketing. We really have to do something. And in the future, you have to think about not only, um, you know, revenue and stuff like that and filling out pitch excels or something like that. The, the earth, we owe the earth something and we have to give it back. So therefore, please stop this and let me, let me personally um, sum it up with four things that we really have to do. Number one, I think, as I said, we have to consider our earth as an important shareholder. There's no way to postpone it or something like that. There is no, no waiting button. So the earth is not waiting for us that we, we are ready for something. It is dying. And number two, um, we need to get to net zero really, really fast. So this is not something that we can, you know, discuss tomorrow or something like that. There is a disaster coming our way. And number three, we have to develop new kind of technologies and methods together. And we have to do really fast. We have to be fast on that. And to the, the point that I already said before, we have to do it together. 
we all have to do it together, right? And this is my final last words. And I would love you now to, um, you know, day one is coming to an end. Enjoy with a beer or a water maybe um, and the booth party right now, this kind of ending, but also think, rethink how we do marketing. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank all of you for those very remarkable last words for this very valuable and inspiring talk as grand finale of our today's tour along the very peaks of tech in digital marketing. I hope you learned something, I learned a lot. And I hope to see you back tomorrow here at Tech Stage of DMX Co. Uh, we're starting at 10 o'clock, should be doable, maybe. Uh, if you don't go to the party over there. So have a good night. Bye.